Dobro veke svima koji ovogodišnji Proze Fest prate iz svojih domova. Moje ime je Arijana Luburić-Pijanović, predajem književnost na Filozofskom fakultetu i večeras ću razgovarati sa renomiranim britanskim pistem Karilom Filipsom, čiji je roman Daleka obala upravo izašao u prevodu na srpski jezik. To je ujedno i prvo Filipsovo delo koje se pojavilo na srpskom jeziku. Porazgovarat ćemo i o tom delu i o ostalim njegovim delima, o njegovom opusu uopšteno, a ja ću vam za sada samo ukratko predstaviti ovog pista. Reč je o poznatom proznom i dramskom pistu koji je takođe autor dokumentarne proze, autor je dokumentarac za radio i televiziju kao i dva scenarija za filmove. Profesor je na Univerzitetu Yale i dobitnik brojnih književnih nagrada i priznanja, među kojima se ističu James Tate Black Memorial Prize za roman Crossing the River, koji je bio i užen izboru za Bukerovu nagradu i Commonwealth Writers Prize za roman Daleka obala, koji je takođe bio u izboru za Bukerovu nagradu i za nagradu Penn Faulkner. Reč je o pistu koji na različite načine povezuje kolonijalizam i njegovo nasledđe, robovlasništvo, trgovinu robljem i savremene oblike rasne diskriminacije, ali se ne zadržava na tome, zato što povezuje afričku i jevrijsku dijasporu, rasno i rodno ugnjetavanje, tako da obeskorenjenost, izmeštenost, usamljeništvo posmatra u veoma različitim kontekstima. Budući da prati istorije izmeštenih, raštrkanih likova, likova čiji su identiteti izmešteni i čije su životne priče u mnogome izmeštene i njegove strukture su takve. Kada priča o robovima i njihovim potomcima u savremenom svetu, kada priča o ilegalnim imigrantima i beloputim engleskinjama koji žive u nekako prijateljski nastrojenim sredinama savremenih zapadnih društava, kada poredi jevrejsku i afričku dijasporu, on ne nastoji da ta iskustva i te različite istorijske kontekste izjednači. Naprotiv, on ih posmatra sa velikom dozom poštovanja prema njihovim osobenostima, prema osobenostima tih iskustava. Pokušava povlačenjem paralela između tih konteksta da nam ukaže na jednu poražavajuću istorijsku konstantu. Marginalizacija, progon, diskriminacija, nasilje opstaju. Oni menjaju kontekst, menjaju metu, ali opstaju. Upravo to nam poručuje između ostalog i roman Daleka obala, kontrapunktna jedna pripovest koja s jedne strane prati priču jednog afričkog imigranta, a sa druge strane jedne profesorke klavira u prinudnoj penziji. On beži pred užasima građanskog rata, odlazi ilegalnim putem u Englesku i tamo traži azil i traga za novim životom i novim identitetom. A ona, s druge strane, njenu životnu priču pratimo kroz čitav niz disfunkcionalnih odnosa iz kojih ona izlazi emotivno i psihički razoreno. Ona se povlači pred čitavim nizom profesionalnih i ličnih neuspeha i njihova poglavlja koja se na izmenično nižu zajednički grade sliku o jednom društvu u kom se kosmopolitska stremljenja suprotstavljaju rasizmu i nasilju. Nasilje koje on trpi kao rasno drugo, pandan je nasilju koje ona trpi kao žena. I njihova poglavlja zapravo zajednički grade sliku o naličju multikulturne, multietničke, multirasne engleske. Tako da ovaj roman nije samo priča o dvoje usamljenika koji pronalaze neku privremenu utehu u površnom međusobnom odnosu, nego i roman o naciji, roman o savremenom britanskom društvu gde muška i ženska perspektiva, imigranska i starostedelačka, outsiderska i insiderska perspektiva predstavljaju kao ono što Dorati prigodno naziva tamnom stranom meseca. O svemu tome ćemo razgovarati naravno sa samim piscem. With us today is the renowned British author Carol Phillips. Thank you very much for being with us. Um, your novel, A Distant Shore, has just appeared in Serbian translation, and this is the first work by you uh, that has appeared in Serbian. And we're going to talk about that novel, but first I would like to talk to you 
about your work in general. So when I think about your work, um, I imagine you as a kind of medium, someone with a very powerful ability to summon voices from various contexts. Um, voices of, of slaves and their descendants in the contemporary world, slave traders, uh, members of the Jewish diaspora, uh, white women in oppressive environments, illegal migrants in hostile host countries. So they all come from very different places in different times. Will you tell us a bit about these voices and what connects them? Um, well, first of all, thank you for in inviting me to take part in, in the... Um, Processed and um, yeah, I'm very happy to be translated by you. Thank you into Serbian. Another language is always another readership, and and it's a it's a privilege to reach new readers, particularly new young readers. Um, I don't know. You ask a very good question. Um, I don't think any author really knows uh, where the voices of their novels. Um, or plays, I guess, if, if you're writing plays, you don't really know where these fictional voices come from. Um, I think that in my own case, if I tried to logically work out why so many different voices appear to me, um, then I think that's what I would be doing. That's, that would be my job, to figure it out, to, to kind of deconstruct myself and work out why I am the way I am. But I leave that to other people to figure out. You know, there's a great number of uh, very serious and devoted academics who uh, take a great deal of pleasure in taking writers' books and figuring out what the writer was trying to do and figuring out something about the writer's life and the relationship to the work. So I, I tend not to worry too much about where these voices come from or why they appear to me and just worry about hoping, keeping my fingers crossed, that um, some more voices appear that's that's my honest answer is i i don't know but i just don't worry about it and many of these voices are voices of people who've experienced underprivileged migration now this concern is partly autobiographical okay. um because your ancestors and you yourself have experienced uh, migration can you tell us a bit about migration and yeah. some of the other overarching themes in your work that I do understand a little bit about because obviously, you know, writers are doing two things most of the time. Again, not consciously, but if they stop and, you know, take a moment, take a coffee, take a beer, reflect, um, you know, writers are using themselves as a source of um, material. Um, your, your, the kind of the autobiographical movements of your life will find their way somehow into the work. And then the other thing is that, of course, we're social animals. We don't live in isolation. We live um, in the social and the political history of our time, in the social and political history of our countries. And um, we can't hide from that. So I think the material um, comes from a personal source, but the material also comes from just looking around and being a uh, human beings as social animals. And so for somebody like myself who came to Britain um, as a baby uh, from the West Indies, from the Caribbean, and was a migrant, you know, was a migrant before I could speak, before I could walk, I was a migrant to, to a, a new cold country that I grew up in, um, feeling something of an outsider. Um, so obviously that experience is going to find its way into my work. But I also grew up in a country, Britain, where the experiences of Britain since, the, I guess, the end of the Second World War have been uh, huge, um, not just in terms of the transformation of the country into a multiracial and, and uh, uh, you know, a multicultural country, um, you know, Britain has joined Europe, the, you know, the, the European community is leaving the European community. Britain has lost an empire um, or, or claims to have given independence to certain countries. But, you know, let's be honest, lost an empire. Um, so the, the huge political and social transformations in Britain um, are also what are reflected in what I write. So I think it's in both the personal and the larger social sense, the question of migration, crossing borders, 
going to another country, transforming oneself, hoping for better for one's children, looking at history to understand why this migration had to happen in the first place. These things, I think, inevitably have found their way into anything that I, I try to write. Now, these thematic concerns and these tectonic shifts that you write about, both on the personal level and on the level of you know, the nation or, or virtually the entire world, if we're talking about imperialism, um, they've also uh, kind of influenced your structures. They seem to be at least partly responsible for the scattered st structures, the fragmented st structures that you use. Now, this has also been attributed to the influence of music, um, what inspires you to write such structures, to use such structures? Um, well, I mean, I, I think you, you sort of half answer it by what you're saying, you know, in, in, your, in your question. If you're writing about migration, um, if you're writing about having to learn another language, having to come to terms with different religions, um, having to come to terms with different types of food because you've come to a new country, um, you can't make yourself, ex you know, you can't fully explain who you are because people don't understand the world you've arrived from. Um, if you're a child growing up, as I was in England, there are no um, grandparents because the grandparents, I never knew any of my grandparents. These things suggest discontinuity. There's kind of rupture. Nothing flows easily for migrants. Um, because they're always trying to, almost like a, a puzzle, piece together who they are from a bit of that history, a bit of what they've heard from their parents, a bit of what they're told at school, a bit of what they're not told at school, something that the government is telling them, um, something that somebody in the schoolyard is telling them, which isn't necessarily always going to be nice. Uh, so you're trying to make a kind of patchwork. Um, it's like a puzzle of your own life. And so... I think the structures that I choose to write in are kind of informed by these, what I call discontinuities that are the evidence of a, a, a writer's, uh, evidence rather of a migrant's life. Music is obviously another form that interests me because, you know, music has a similar kind of element of, it has discontinuity because you draw, whether you're talking about classical music or whether you're talking about pop music, um, it has, refrains it has echoes it has choruses that come back um it doesn't begin with a beginning a middle and an end it has a way of if you like harmoniously putting together discontinuity so music has always been an interesting form for me to look at to think about how to structure a story um you mentioned discontinuity discontinuity is something that characterizes a distant shore as well and uh, the voices in a distant shore are, are also voices of your chorus of common memory that appears in, in crossing the river. Um, this particular story is a contrapuntal narrative um, where you have um, different chapters spoken by different characters and um, it's fragmented yet cohesive. And these chapters tell a very difficult story of loss and abandonment. Uh, will you tell us uh, what's behind this particular novel? Uh, what's the main idea and how it relates to your other work? Uh, well, I, I, you know, first of all, I think it, it relates to the other work in that I think that, I think that um, like most writers, I think I'm just writing one book. Uh, you know, it all seems to me to be the same thing. It's just, you know, you revisit the same themes over and over again in diff with different characters appearing and, you know, different plot lines. But the thematic concern is always the same um, to a certain degree, which is, you know, the idea of belonging, um, the idea of belonging and the sheer um, loneliness that can happen, that can descend upon people's lives if we don't communicate with each other. And often when a society is changing quite radically, um, people fall out of tune with their society. You know, you can be in tune with a society one day and then the next day you, you don't feel like you belong suddenly. I'll give you a very concrete example. 
You know, on um, September the 11th, 2001, when there was the sort of bombing of the World Trade Center in New York, um, I, I, I was there, I lived in New York um, then. And, you know, if you were um, a, a, an American citizen who was, um, whose religion was Islam, and you know, there were mil you know, hundreds of thousands of people, September the 11th was an okay day to be an American citizen. You felt in tune with your country. But after that, horrible episode um there was a sort of rise of islamophobia and americans who were muslims on september the 12th suddenly felt out of tune with the country they the changes that were happening in the country the political and social changes made them feel um they didn't belong so this is a very long-winded way of saying the very first line of, of this novel a distant shore is england has changed um and for so many people, England has changed. Um, it, as I said, it doesn't have an empire. It's no longer a country that is Christian or totally Christian. It's no longer a country that is, you know, all white and doesn't have brown or black faces. It's no longer a largely, in theory, patriarchal society in which men are, you know, unquestionably at the top of the pile because there have been a couple of women prime ministers now, which is a big deal in such a patriarchal country. So it's true, England has changed, which is why that's the first line. Um, the person who feels that England has changed is, is a, a retired school teacher living in a small village who is trying to come to terms with all sorts of strange changes about her life uh, in this village. The village itself has changed because it, it's now, you know, it used to be a very conservative, village but now it has these new houses that have been built and new people who've come to live there and once one amongst these new people happens to be African um, and so out of her isolation and his isolation they the novel is essentially about them trying to speak to each other their neighbors but the difficulty of people trying to speak to each other when they both feel that the country or the home that they recognize has changed um, it, is, it requires sometimes quite a heroic effort, even just to say hello to somebody who doesn't look like you. So that's effectively what the novel is about. Will you read us a passage from the novel so that our listeners can get a feel of, of these changes and this attempt at communication? Sure, why don't I just read you the first paragraph? you know, which begins with the sentence I just quoted. And, you know, it's, it's about something tiny, you know, it's about the name of the village. You know, the, as I said, the very name suggests shifts in class, you know, which is a very big indicator of belonging and identity, particularly in British society. Um, you know, with the building of new houses comes a certain snobbishness and snootiness and exclusivity that you know, that's part of the change. There's so many changes. So I'll just read the very first um, paragraph. Um, okay. England has changed. These days, it's difficult to tell who's from around here and who's not, who belongs and who's a stranger. It's disturbing. It doesn't feel right. Three months ago, in early June, I moved out here to this new development called Stonely. None of the old villagers seemed comfortable with the term new development. They simply call Stonely the new houses on the hill. After all, our houses are set up, are set on the edge of Weston, a village that is hardly going to give up its name and its identity because some developer has seen a way to make a quick buck by throwing up some semi-detached bungalows, slapping a carriage lamp on the front of them and then calling them stonely. If anybody asks me, I say, I just say I live in Weston. Everybody does, except one or two who insist on writing their addresses as stonely. The postman told me that they add Weston as an afterthought, as though the former civilizes the latter. He was annoyed and he wanted me to know that once upon a time there'd been a move to change the name of Weston to Market Weston, but it never caught on. 
He was keen that I should understand that there was nothing wrong with Weston. And once he started, I could hardly get him to stop. Now, that was last week when he had to knock on the door for he had a package that wouldn't fit through the letterbox and he said that he didn't want to squash it up. He told me that he'd been instructed by head office to scratch out the name Stonely if it appeared on any envelopes. Should the residents turn out to be persistent offenders, then he was to politely remind them that they lived in Weston. But he told me that he didn't think he would be able to do this, that actually, if they wanted to live in Cloud Cuckoo Land, then who was he to stop them? He didn't tell this to his boss, of course, because that would have been his job there and then on the spot. So, I mean, that's, that's just the first paragraph. And as I said, that's just, even in the naming of a, of a place, there's a sense of change and tension and unrest around the issue of, you know, how fancy does this place sound? And, you know, as the novel uh, begins to unfold, um, you know, the issue of how England has changed becomes a lot more complicated around, you know, these issues to do with race and, and migration and belonging as well. And I suppose smaller places, and this novel is set in a small place rather than a, a big city. Uh, in smaller, smaller places tend to be more resistant to change. Uh, now, we've witnessed quite a few changes um, in the past year in particular, how relevant do you think this particular novel is now uh, when we are forced to live in isolation? Because isolation is a very prominent, um, it's very prominent in the novel uh, with all the shootings and protests in America and across the world with uh, Europe's migrant crisis in the recent years. How relevant do you think this novel is now at this particular moment? Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm biased because I think it's relevant, you know, but I think, I mean, I think if you're trying to do anything about communicating um, and getting out of um, the, I mean, the, the, the sort of terror of retreating, a kind of very narrow essentialist box, which suggests my identity is fixed and it is just this, um, it's so important to communicate and realize that identity is always fluid and is moving and that we need to speak and that we need to, you know, we do know, as you say, the last, what's happened in the last, this, this year, I mean, that feeling of being cut off from each other um, is, is very disturbing and it can be alleviated just by what we're doing now, a Zoom conversation, a phone conversation. Um, when you can't meet people as freely face to face, you do begin to feel the terror of isolation that I think a lot of people feel naturally in their lives, you know, and a lot of people find it difficult to break out of that sense of isolation because it gives them a safety, you know, that notion that this is who I am and the world might be changing around me in this strange way, but I'm just going to, I'm not going to change with it. I'm just going to cling on to who, who I am. I think what the novel is trying to say, and I think what so many other novels and so many other writers and commentators are trying to say is that one must have the, you know, the courage to dare to imagine, to communicate with others who perhaps um, are not like you uh, or, or who are slightly different from you in some way and whose worldview you can share if you, if you take the time and the trouble to step out of the small box that we're all in danger of making of our lives. Thank you. Now with us today are also um, final year pupils of the Elite Grammar School, Jovan Jovano Izmai and their teachers, and they have a few questions for you as well, please. Okay, I hope I, hope, I, hope I can answer. <laughs> All right. Uh, good evening, Mr. Philip. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, seeing that your book, The Distant Shore, just got translated to Serbian, I would like to focus on the writing aspect of it. Um, as you said, the book follows Gabriel and Dorothy, but what I found interesting is the changes in perspective both in uh, Gabriel and Dorothy's um, POVs. So, uh, could you talk us to the uh, thinking process? Why did you change the perspective and uh, what impact did that have on the book? 
Uh, well, thanks. Thanks for your question. Good question. I mean, you, if I'd have just written it from, say, Dorothy's point of view, um, then you would never have fully understood the full humanity of this other person's story. I mean, one of the things that um, the fiction can do is it can take us and transport us into the lives of people that are not ourselves. I mean, that's part of the great moral uh, imperative of fiction is that it allows us to go beyond ourselves and enter lives of people who are not us. And that to me um, is, is the importance of fiction because, you know, it's, it's a great, it's a great force of resistance against all sorts of kind of unpleasant narrowing of thought, um, daring to imagine other people's lives. It's particularly important now, I think, because so much of the social media that um, people uh, allow themselves to be, um, allow themselves to be impacted by, you know, um, is effectively narcissistic. Um, and I'm thinking of things like Facebook, I'm thinking of logging on to any website which immediately recognizes and says, hey, you know, hey, Bobby, it's good to have you back. I think you're going to like that. I've been following you. And I think there's this sense that you are the most important person in the world. Um, and fiction actually says you have to suspend who you are for a minute and engage with other people. So within the context of the novel, I wanted to also do that. Dorothy isn't able to fully imagine who this person is. Um, because his experiences are so far beyond hers. But at the same time, the only way I can give his experience is by completely switching to his point of view. But similarly, Gabriel's not going to be able to fully imagine this lady's, um, Dorothy's life experience and what appeared to, perhaps to him, to be less um, global or... Um, uh, you know, less apocalyptic worries because her worries are very domestic, effectively. You know, they're about teaching, they're about her sister, they're about her family. But we as a reader can actually see that for both of them, these are really deeply important um, journeys that they've made, emotional journeys, physical journeys. Even, even though Dorothy's is a small physical journey, it's still a migration of sorts. Um, and by switching points of view, I think I'm able to give the reader an opportunity to see the full dignity of both of these lives rather than just seeing the one life, you know, effectively Gabriel's life through her eyes. So that's why I did it, to try to suggest that we, we have to make an effort to break out of what I've, I call those small essentialist boxes we can get trapped into. But as a writer, I can do that for you by basically saying, okay, we're now going to go to his point of view. So that's kind of why I did it. Um, and the structure, uh, the structure itself is quite interesting. Um, the book doesn't rely on the traditional uh, chapter format, but rather it is split in five parts. Now the book seems quite, um, it seems quite stream of consciousness to the reader. Do you even plan a book that uh, seems so stream of consciousness? How do you go about writing that? Well, the only way to go about writing a book, I mean, this basically, okay, I'll tell you what happens. When I'm um, speaking to people, uh, to students who want to write, who want to be writers, um, I always have to remind them that character comes before plot. Um, that you can't just sketch out a plot and just say this happens, this happens, and this happens, and then sit down and write it and expect the book to work. Because what really um, keeps our interest in a book, um, and I'm talking about literary fiction, I'm not talking about detective novels or thrillers. Um, there's nothing wrong with detective novels or thrillers, but I'm talking about what we traditionally know as literary fiction. Um, what keeps our attention is character, because we worry about these characters, we think about them, we, we are concerned with their lives. Um, that's what I mean about it. It, it. it takes us into the lives of people that are not us. It's very important. So 
if you sit down and you just try to, and it's a very difficult thing to write a novel, of course, it takes a long time. Um, you're always going to look for shortcuts. You know, it, it's, it's a headache. You, you know, you're stuck in a room by yourself. I mean, it's, it's like what you have to do, I'm, as, I'm sure, as, as students. It's like writing an essay, but it's an essay that goes on for about two years or three years. It's, you know, it's like, oh, stop. Um, you look for, you're looking for shortcuts, of course. And the easiest shortcut is just to focus on what happens. Actually, that doesn't deliver you to a novel. That delivers a plot. What in the engine room of a novel is who are these people? And that's what takes a tremendous amount of time and a tremendous amount of energy is finding their voices, finding their lives. Um, so that's what I spend most of my time doing. That's what most of my consciousness is when I'm thinking about a novel. I'm not thinking about the themes of it. I'm not even thinking about what happens most of the time. I'm thinking about who are these people, who are their lives, and it's happened to me in the past, it didn't happen in this novel, but it has happened to me in the past where I've had two characters perhaps, and as I've gone deeper into their lives, one voice has sort of obliterated the other voice, so that I become so much more invested in that character, and then it becomes a more traditional novel where it's just effectively one voice and there's not much switching back and forth. But in this novel, the more I began to think about it, both voices were rising up. And so I had to find a way of including both voices. But, you know, the short answer to your question is, you know, my process is always the same. It's, um, it's to try to find a shortcut, fail, and then find myself back in the same place, which is who, who are these people that I'm trying to write about? Uh, your books also cover hard hitting topics uh, while also managing to feel like a uh, relaxing read. Uh, how do you balance, um, how do you keep a balance between a serious and light tone? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I think, I mean, it's a good question. I mean, I think it, again, it comes from the, um, it has to come from the characters to a certain extent, you know, I mean, I guess this is something which comes out of your own life as well, you know, because even if you're writing about what appear to be, you know, reasonably heavy themes and difficult subject matter, um, you know, and a lot of these themes and a lot of these ideas are dealing with very difficult things, you know, war, genocide, migration, loneliness, homelessness. Um, you can't, you know, you if you allowed that to become the, the kind of baseline for your life, then I think you'd be a pretty miserable person. <laughs> you know I mean? You can't allow that to just become the dominant tone because even as we know, even in the midst of the most terrible situations, people find humor. Uh, people find moments of levity. They find moments where um, we, we know this from reading European history, you know, um, you know, the, the last hundred years, Europe has been through some terrible, terrible crises. Um, but even in the midst of some of these crises, people have found ways to spotlight the levity and the coming together, as well as, um, quite rightly, illustrating the darker moments. But I think that's that's um, that that's a part of my own vision of the world, I guess, if you like, is that I, I don't think that anything is gained by rubbing people's faces in negativity, negativity, ne negativity. I also don't think it's true to the human experience. I think, um, you know, I think humor and irony uh, are an essential part of survival. They, you know, they're part, they're tools for survival. All right, uh, thank you. Now I will give the word to Brian, of course, as a couple of questions. All right, thank you for your questions. Uh, good evening, Mr. Phillips. Uh, my uh, first impressions of both main characters and their part of the story didn't make them very likable to the reader. And uh, how do you feel about the non-likable characters on the reader versus the likable ones. Uh, do you think that people tend to think more about the topics covered in the book dominated by characters they like? Um, again, it's a good, it's a good question. Um, I don't think it really matters too much um, 
whether we like characters when we read books, because I've read plenty of books where, and indeed I still read plenty of books that I enjoy and admire where I don't particularly like the characters. They're not people I want to have a drink with. I don't want to hang out with these people. Um, but I read about them because I want to understand them. And, I, and that, again, I think that's part of the moral um, imperative of fiction. It enables us to understand people. Um, so I think understanding is actually more important than liking. Um, I, would I want to have a drink with Dorothy and, you know, go, go to the movies with her? Hell no. You know, you know, I don't think so. But the aim is not to write somebody who eventually becomes a really nice, sunny, happy-go-lucky lady who, because she met Gabriel, you know, um, is now knows more about the world and has great insight into herself and, and you know, wants to go out and work with refugees. You know, uh, that's, not, that's not who she is. She's under pressure. She's kind of miserable. Uh, at times a little mean-spirited and, and it doesn't go well for her. But I do understand her better at the end of the book than I did at the beginning. And that's really all you can ask, I think, from most fiction. Uh, so uh, was there any inspiration in your personal life for the characters? Um, yeah, I mean, I... Again, I, I don't know where most books begin. I mean, I can a couple of books of mine, I can actually pinpoint a moment or a photograph or um, a conversation that led me to think about, a, you know, something that eventually became a book. With this one, the only thing I can honestly say that I, I, that occurred to me was, in, in um, I think in the year 2000, maybe in the year 2001, I can't remember exactly, but I went to Sierra Leone uh, in West Africa to write a piece for the Guardian newspaper um, about, in the wake of the civil war there, about the fact that there was a country in the world with no bookshops. Um, and I was fascinated um, what a country with no bookshops would look like, what they would do about literacy. And they also had a chapter of the uh, writers, the International Writers Union, PEN. They had a chapter of PEN, um, you know, or, or a, a kind of PEN organization there, which w had no money and they'd lost a lot of writers in the war. So I went to write about them and to meet and to see if I could do anything about raising money. And I, I met people there who had lost relatives in that war and, and there'd been child soldiers that I came across. And so I think being in Sierra Leone at that time made me think. And of course, all of them, all, most of the people I met wanted to migrate. They wanted to leave the country because the infrastructure of the country had been shattered by the war. So, um, and they wanted, most of them wanted to come to Britain because they were English speaking in Sierra Leone and they wanted to come to an English speaking country. Um, so I think that experience perhaps fed into the novel a little bit. Um, well, not perhaps, I'm sure it did. Um, the other thing is, you know, I, uh, my own life, I, you know, I've been surrounded by lots of Dorothys um, growing up in England, you know, I went to school in England. I had school teachers in England, you know, and, and you know, uh, my mother was a school teacher. Um, so I was kind of familiar with, um, you know, difficult school teachers. I'm very familiar with difficult school teachers. I grew up in a house with one. So, you know, that helped as well. Don't tell my mother I said that. So both Dorothy and Gabriel change throughout the book. Uh, were the change, uh, changes uh, in character traits in, intentional upon changing their perspectives? And I mean... Yeah. No, sorry, I interrupted you. I was, gonna, I was just going to say, again, a favorite phrase that I use with, with, with uh, my own students in 
when whenever I'm teaching fiction is that I always ask them, um, what's the growth to understanding that your character is making? You know, in what way are they growing and changing? Because if a character is not growing and changing in some way, um, and they just remain static, then really, what's the point of the book? Because a character has to make a journey. I mean, any encounter that we make in our lives, you know, you go to college, you go to, you know, you do a job, you don't come out at the end of the three or four years at college, or you don't come out at the end of five or six years doing a job at a newspaper, for instance, the same person you were when you went in. Because all the experiences that you have, the people you meet, um, they've changed you in some way. So a character who passes through a novel for, sometimes it doesn't have to be too long, it can be a month, sometimes it's years, he's not going to come out of the same, the same character at the end. Otherwise, why are we reading this? So I make them, I try to encourage them to think about the growth to understanding that is happening in the character. And sometimes the character doesn't understand that they have changed themselves. But we as a reader have to understand that they've changed because we have a, you know, we're, we're like playing some kind of deity in heaven looking down at them. So we can see more than they can see. And particularly in a novel like this, which is switching with points of view, we as a reader, we see more than them. So we can track the way in which they're changing, even if they themselves can't. But in many, you know, in many cases in a novel, there is a growth to understanding in the character. And obviously in the reader, there has to be some kind of understanding of how there's been change. So that, that I'm looking for what kind of transformation has happened. Um, and it, it doesn't always have to be a transformation to come back to your first question. It, it doesn't, doesn't always have to be a transformation which is delivering them to a place where they are a nicer person, you know, but there's still got to be a change. Uh, so how would you describe the main characters? Uh, what traits uh, were in focus when you were creating them? Um, I can't, you know, it's, uh, I can't remember exactly. I mean, I, uh, if, I, if I was thinking that rationally um, or logically, I will say that the, the, the word that was on my, in my mind or the word that was uppermost in my mind when I was writing this book um, was loneliness you know, the, the isolation and the loneliness. And so people have different ways of dealing with that. I mean, I think the first image that came to me in the whole book, the very first image that I thought about was a woman looking out of a window at a man next door washing his car and wondering what he's doing and if she should go and speak to him. Um, that was the very first image. And that's a sort of loneliness. And whenever I see, you know, it's usually guys with a bucket washing their car on a Sunday afternoon by themselves. I always think there's something quite lonely about that. You know, why not go to a car wash or, you know, why not pay some kids to do it? You know, what are you doing? You're washing a car by yourself on a Sunday afternoon. There's something quite rhythmic and isolated and it suggests a particular kind of solitude. But there's also something which suggests a particular sign of solitude where you're looking, you're peeking the curtains back and you're looking through, but you don't quite know how to move to the front door, step out into the world and actually say something. So there was a sort of double type of solitude that I was thinking about. So that was definitely the first image. Thank you. And uh, uh, how did the story, uh, how the stories of Dorothy and Gabriel come together? Seeing that they uh, they each have their own story and only meets and the end of the it only comes together because they, by virtue of the accident, that they happen to be living next door to each other. Otherwise, they probably would be, you know, to use the old cliche, they would probably be ships passing in the night, you know. Um, it's, it's just a, it, it's just a, you know, it's an accident uh, that they happen to be living next door to each other. But it's, that's the thing. Um, 
if they were not living next door to each other, she wouldn't have spoken to him. Because if she saw him on a bus or standing waiting for a train or in the supermarket, she's not going to have a conversation with him because he will be somebody that they're passing each other and their lives are just going on in. But the accident that they happen to be neighbors forces transformation in both of their lives. So um, I guess without, without that accident, they couldn't have been a, a, a novel. So, you know, perhaps that's why I begin quite specifically by painting a portrait of this place and its history, um, the village, I mean, and the transformations in it, because the, the, the village, the place becomes, uh, it's a small place, but it's a, it becomes a place which is allowing, somewhat ironically and unexpectedly, allows this transformation to happen. You would expect something like this to happen perhaps in a big city in London or in Manchester or in Paris or in Amsterdam, you know, a much more cosmopolitan city where it would be possible for people to bump up against each other in this way. And, but there's something ironic about the fact that England is changing and it actually is changing so radically that it can happen in a tiny place now. So I think that that's, uh, you know, that's the best way I think I can answer your question. Thank you very much. I give my words to Isidora. Okay. Good evening, Mr. Phillips. Hi. So, pulling away from this specific book, I would like to talk to you about literature in general. So, literature is known to reflect people's feelings and thoughts during a certain time period, and I would like to, I would like to ask you because of that, how what is the impact literature has on, uh, on ra like on racism and the general view on racism and relations between black and white members of a community? Well, I don't think, I don't think, uh, I mean, racism is a kind of endemic social problem that I don't think literature by itself can do much about. I mean, um, all literature can do is, you know, what, what I was saying a, a few minutes ago, it can help you to, um, imaginatively engage with people who are not you. And that's the beginning of breaking down racism. Racism is about making your mind smaller, uh, making it less basically civilized and less cultured because you assume that people who are not you are in some way inferior to you. Um, literature, it doesn't work like that. Literature works on the basis that everybody is part of the same family. If it wasn't the case, then you couldn't, you, we couldn't read books from France, New Zealand, India, Serbia, Canada, we couldn't read them because we would all be locked in our um, national literatures and we would have no ability to read across borders. But we know, which is why translation is important, that we know that a story from South Africa is relevant to somebody in Belgrade. We know that a story from Paris is relevant to somebody in Sydney. Because why? Because the basic component of that story are human beings and we're all the same family. And literature just reminds us of that. So by reading literature, we can go some way towards breaking down uh, the mindset that people take in order to become racist or, you know, Islamophobic or sexist or homophobic. Race, uh, literature can help us break down some of these uh, prejudices which society inculcates into our spirit or into our soul um, rather stealthily. But of itself, uh, it, it's going to take a, a, a lot more than literature to, you know, to tackle a, a problem as, as um, deep as, as racism. It requires those rather strange characters called politicians. Um, it requires legislation. It requires teachers, uh, really requires teachers in classrooms. It requires social workers. It requires a whole bunch of people um, to tackle this issue. Writers are just hopefully part of the solution if, 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 if they're doing their jobs properly. And second of all, is there a difference between black literature in America and in Britain since you lived in both of those countries and how is it received in them? Uh, 
I don't really, I mean, I'm sitting talking to you now in the United States. Um, you know, uh, I don't know. You see, because to me, there's, I'm not, I'm never really sure what black literature is because, you know, is that literature that has got black characters in it? Um, and if so, does that make Huckleberry Finn black literature? Um, and Robinson Crusoe, is that, is that black literature because it's got black, or is it like literature that's written by people who are black? Um, but then what happens if there's not, no black characters in it? So the definitions to me are always slightly um, problematic. What I will say is that there is, a, a, there is a more of a tradition in the United States of America, of course, of having books by people uh, who are black and about characters who are black. There's a longer tradition, you know, that goes back hundreds of years than in Britain. Um, and therefore, you know, it's perhaps examined more in the curriculum of universities and schools and, you know, discussed more in their bookshelves, in bookshops, the few bookshops we have left. Um, there are shelves on, you know, in books that will say, you know, African-American literature over here. You get a bit of that in Britain now, uh, certainly more than when I was growing up, but it's a very different uh, tradition. And as I say, the definitions um, in both countries are, are always subject to change and flux. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really sure. I mean, I'm not bothered about, you know, one of the things you learn quickly as a writer, if you want to stay sane uh, and not lose your mind, is you shouldn't worry, worry too much about what people say about you because um, you can't control that. All you can control is the, what you're doing on the page. Um, and I keep your fingers crossed that you're fortunate enough to find a publisher and equally fortunate enough to find a readership. But you can't really control where you will be placed in a syllabus, whether I'm, my books are on Caribbean literature, British literature, um, post-colonial literature, literature of empire, um, whatever label you're in on the bookshelf, in the library or in a bookshop or whatever syllabus you happen to be placed, you can't do anything about it. So there's no point in getting all upset and antsy because you're not in that particular category or that particular. I just think that, um, you know, it's all literature, whether, you know, so when people say, you know, well, this is women's fiction, I always think, well, what is women's fiction? You know, who is imposing these labels? And because it all boils down to the same thing. Everybody's trying to write uh, as intelligently as possible with the language that they have at their disposal to breathe life into characters who are sensitive and not predictable and not clumsy. Um, but, you know, I think it's slightly different. You know, the question of black literature, as you said, I think it's slightly different in both countries, US and Britain, that is. Thank you very much for your answers. Carol Phillips, thank you very much for being with us today. And special thanks to Dushan Boyana and Isidora for these amazing questions. They are truly inspiring. And good luck to the book. Um, well, no, well, first of all, the questions are, are, are terrific and thank you. I'm not, I'm not used to doing so much work on a Thursday lunchtime. <laughs> so it's lunchtime over here. So thank you. I'll, um, you know, I got, you gave me a lot to think about and, and, uh, and as for good luck for the book, I should thank you uh, for the translation and for, uh, you know, arranging this, this platform, this, this, um, this conversation. Uh, I hope the book does well. I think, I hope the book does well in Serbia. I mean, I'm, oh, I'm old enough to remember, um, Yugoslavia, uh, obviously, and most of my memories, of course, being a kid who grew up in England, center around football. So, you know, I remember Red Star, Belgrade, I remember everything is, is about football with me, and, uh, and I'm, I'm just delighted and, and happy that, uh, as I said, you know, you've, you've 
paid a great compliment to the book by translating it into into Serbian. So thank you. <laughs>